Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We hope you're encouraged and blessed by it. If you want to know more about our church, please visit our website at southportchurchonline.com. I hope this week is a blessed week for you, and if we have not met you, we would love to. Please visit our church um, at either our 9 o'clock or our 1030 service on Sunday. God bless. All right. Church, as we're transitioning, let's pray together as we prepare to receive the word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your children. God, we thank you for just the opportunity we get to encourage their faith in you. And we recognize your great love for them and for us. And God, as we seek to hear from the word, your holy Bible, God, we pray that we understand that it's truth for us and it's life for us, God. We pray that we're able to continue to grow with greatness by your love. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Ms. Barbara. I want to thank Mary Lee. I want to thank Eileen and anyone else. If you were a part of VBS in any capacity, could you stand up for just a moment? Stretch your legs, right? I want to say thank you to all of you. Well done. And uh, there we go. And uh, thank you for the time, the effort, the attention, the investment, the sacrifice, the everything that took place. And um, I, I was here this week. I had the pleasure um, of witnessing all that went on and all the transformation and all the snacks and all the, all the good stuff. And, um, you know, I, uh, if you were wondering who uh, Pastor Bob was, that was me. I wore a red t-shirt all week with the two big eyes. And um, I forgot I was wearing it when I went out into the rest of the community. And... Uh, <laughs> And so I was getting some looks, and I was, oh yeah, hi, I love kids, yeah. Oh, you're a pastor, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> so, uh, aka Pastor, pastor Bob, Pastor Micah here, um, but it's just a joy to see how kids enrich our lives, and all that takes place when we're together and we're seeing uh, the efforts that are made and that we desire for them to know who Jesus is in their hearts. And it's humbling to consider that to God, the degree that these little ones are important in his kingdom, they're highly important to him. And, in, and so we can see that a child who is innocent to malice or hate, but familiar in his love, is truly great in his kingdom. And that had me considering this week what does it mean to be truly great or true greatness? And I know I desire that my kids will be great one day. I desire that they will know him and walk him and continue to be lifelong followers of God. And, and I know many of you this morning who have kids or young family members that it's a, it, your hope is that their future is going to be great, that they're going to live great lives. And that is going to be the next generation of our church as what they aspire to and what they, they live into and what they will do. And I know for many of us, we desire to be great in, the, in whatever the task that we have before us each and every day. And we know that we want to be great in our work. We want to be great in our relationships. We want to be great in our goals. We want to just have a great life. It's just a natural desire to have, to see it take shape. And I know that many of us in some fashions or some form, we've wanted to, whether we admit it or not, we've wanted prestige or we've wanted recognition or we've wanted a larger piece of whatever that pie is. And, and we understand and we learn as adults that, you know, sometimes we feel like we need to put a lot of control into how we obtain that or how we come about that or how it takes shape in our lives. But I want to say that if you desire to be great, I applaud you for that. That you seek to have something that is moving you forward into a new day or a new horizon. It's, it's great that you're aspiring to progress and to grow rather than to be stagnant and kind of just sedentary. But when considering the type of greatness, I wonder what type of greatness do you seek? Many of us have heard of men and women who um, maybe in history or we know of them in their careers and by what they're known for, whether it's their feats or their success or their discoveries or their notoriety. They re revolutionized some part of what it means to, to live in today. Whether it was Mozart or Steve Jobs, we, we often find that if we care to look a little bit deeper past the persona and, and past the, 
the trappings of their notoriety. We often see that the, the true story or we read a biography after their death and we find that the, that greatness was sometimes at the expense of their relationships or their families or the people that needed them the most. And they were great in adoration for the known self, the public self, but the private self was just a desperate mess. And I would argue that we all struggle at many points to have the internal and the external self line up at times, to be on the same page, to be one person, not two or multiple personalities. And I wonder if those internal and external selves point in the same destination or are they at war with each other in some areas of your life? Because we all externally, we can appear and play out what we want people to see of us, right? While internally we can be someone else. But I wonder though, I hope, like we hope for our kids, do you desire to be great in the kingdom of God? And maybe this is a question that you've never considered before. Can you be great in God's kingdom? Is that something for us to obtain or even desire? Well, I want to be able to answer that this morning. And before we turn to scripture, what I want you to do is I want you to say to just somebody around you, be great in the now. Go ahead and say that to somebody. Be great in the now. Some of you are like, I am great. What are you talking about? <laughs> so we're going to turn to Matthew 18. 18, 1 through 5 says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. You know, working with kids this week and seeing a lot of you do that had me considering the nature of our children. And I found these verses to be full of opportunity for us today as we chew on that. Not only practically, but also what, it, what Jesus is saying to us as the church. But first, do you ever wonder if Jesus got frustrated by the kinds of questions that the apostles asked him? Who's greatest, Jesus? Who's greatest? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> I just like to think Jesus, you know, in this fully God and fully human, that sometimes he might, might have a bad Monday, you know. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes if we miss in the Bible, if we only pick up right at 18.1, we're, we're kind of missing the full picture here of what Matthew is wanting us to see. And then just a note that when you read in the Bible at the same time or Therefore, you need to actually go back a little bit and see what, what it's there for, right? And, then, and when you are in your private time or whatever you, if you have an app or whatever it is, I want to encourage you not just to pick the Word of God, but to focus on all of God's Word. Because we can, it's really dangerous to pick it apart and want to leverage one part but ignore the rest. So let's look at the larger picture here. At the end of 17, what we see is that uh, Jesus and the disciples are coming from uh, Capernaum. And they're entering into the temple and there's a tax collector there and said, hey, hey, you need to pay the tax. Of course, this is the Micah abbreviated version, okay? And what happens is, is that Jesus has a little teaching window there. Um, we won't touch on today, but he tells Peter to go and cast a line and to catch a fish. And the first fish he catches, there will be a coin inside that will cover the tax. Wouldn't that be awesome at tax day? Us Christians could just go down to the canal and be like, I need $4,000. Jesus, there it is. <laughs> but that's not how it is. But the reality is, is that what Jesus was doing, he was taking care of a lot, but the apostles, besides Peter, saw that one coin covered Jesus and Peter but not them. And so suddenly they felt that Peter had elevated up in the ranks, thinking, is he greater than us? 
And, I, and I, it makes you think, okay, that makes sense. Why they would approach Jesus and go, uh, we're freaking out. Like, who's the greatest in your kingdom? Because we've been all following you. And we see this coin covers you, a rabbi, and Peter, who's like us. Help us understand is what's happening here. But it's kind of like us, isn't it? Sometimes we, um, we see people cut in line in front of us because, oh, I know them. And it's like 30 people knowing one person, you know, and you've been waiting there an hour and they get on the ride right before you or they get, you're in Chipotle and you ask for, you know, your, your burrito and they scrape the bottom of it and then, and then you move down and right after you, they bring out a fresh trough of chicken, you know, it's all steamy and you're like, I don't want this anymore. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. It's like, what makes them so special? What's wrong with me? You know? And you kind of just wonder, like, what, what's the difference here? And sometimes we even make a face like, what makes them so special? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I kind of just imagine that, you know? That's what's going on there is um, they're looking at Peter and they're like, what makes him so great, right? What's the difference? And Jesus, being God sees that their, their thoughts and he discerns that there's an error in what, what they're thinking. He wants to heal their desire for glory by giving them a competition to be humble. And I think that's very much like our God. And so what happens is when they're seeking to try to prove themselves, Jesus just completely shatters their, their idea of what is great. And who does he call out? A child brings out a child amongst them, these men who are trying to change the world, right? Like all of you, right? Yeah. I hope so. And in their minds, they were operating as we do at times. To be great is based on qualities or quantities that we can tie our name to, that we can be rewarded for. I mean, we, we see it all the time, whether it's Top Chef or um, some of these other competition shows. We, we see that they're prestigious because they succeed and they beat everyone else. And sometimes we live that way too. If we get there first or we have the most or it's the best or the latest or the greatest and suddenly we feel like we're living the great life. And it's, we're informed now by Jesus. Not only do you need, do you need to be a child, childlike faith, or innocence like child to be great in the kingdom. You need to be such to even enter into the kingdom. And you must change your focus of greatness to that which has the ability to develop something greater in God's eyes than what we can try to obtain here on earth. He's teaching us. He's healing us. And I just love that about Christ. He takes what the world sees and he just flips it over. And he reorientates it with the truth. He reorientates us as disciples, what is true and what is pleasing to God. In the world and where we live today, we each have, I think, built up in our minds and in our heart what is the truest expression of greatness. Our self-interest can have us focused on prestige and power and control and wealth and, and what would bend the will of others so that what can be recognized and accredited is us with greatness. And some of us comes in how we even push our kids or spend our time with our kids. And, and sometimes we vicariously compete for our kid to be the greatest and the best. Because we're, sometimes we project that. And we overemphasize. And sometimes we get caught in devoting a lot of time and energy and ensuring there are accolades and trophies and that we miss sometimes opportunities to devote our time and our energy and our attention to discipleship. And what's more important, sometimes we have to ask that they're all stars or that they're believers and disciples after Jesus. And don't get me wrong, sports are amazing. I'm not saying sports or anything else like that. At, you know, enrichment programs, dance, all those things. My kids want to do them too, and I want them involved. But there, there has to come that balance where we're able to see what is the self that we're developing in our, in our families and in our walks and in our time. And we can't ignore what the true riches of life are. So the reality is, is that the church right now struggles because I don't know if you know this, and I've said this before, but the national average for church going in, in America right now is 1.4 times a month. 
I don't know how you do the point four. You get in the car, you drive a quarter of the way there, you come back, you know. I don't get it. <laughs> but I get it. Life is busy. Life is full. There's a lot of schedules, a lot of things that you're trying to afford or trying to figure out. And, and sometimes when our schedules get so full, so busy, all we can focus on is what's tangible. Discipleship is a long journey. Sometimes there's seasons of desert. Sometimes there's season of abundance. Sometimes there's confusion and cloud. And it's intangible. And all you have is your faith at times. And so when we're so focused and we need to be busy, all we can focus on are the, the tangibles. And maybe it turns into what we can do about our wealth and our weight and our wants. And values like these become more of our rubric for greatness rather than the intangible of what does it look like to devote and to trust and to obey the Word of God and the Spirit living in our life. But all that gets taken out from us when Jesus gives us, the church, a clear message that unless we become like a child, we do not enter or can be great in the kingdom of heaven. And that should wake us up. We should listen to that a little more intently if we have been trying to earn our salvation with works or enough wisdom. And what you need to know is this. We have a slide for that. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is the one who becomes the kind of person who imitates the humility and innocence of Christ. So that, and that's another one like therefore in the Bible, so that in them Christ has room to be received. Is there room in you, your life and in your heart for Christ to be received? For him to move in your life? And when I say innocence, I'm not saying being innocent to, to wisdom, but innocent to, to evil or malice. Are you innocent to those things? And are you well-versed and familiar with the love of God? And if we look at your life, and if you were able to take an inventory of your heart right now, is there space for you to receive the likeness of Christ further and f further to influence what you hold on to as important right now? And influence you a measure more to a degree that he wants to influence and draw you towards himself. It kind of sounds like a question that has an obvious answer. Of course I'm doing that. Of course I'm making time and, and I'm praying. Of course I'm doing that. But the reality is I'm just like you. I know how busy we can be. I know how there's demands and opportunities. To quote a, another great preacher, that's not me promoting myself, there's lots of great preachers out there, okay? Annie Stanley says this. He says, decisions, not intentions, leads you to, where, to, to your destination. Decisions, not intentions, lead you to your destination. We make a lot of great intentions on January 1st, right? Sugar's gone. Can't wait. January 5th, you just you know cracking into the uh, you know the sugar there you can't handle it. Decisions, not intentions, lead you to your destination. Is there room for decisions to be made to change more and more into the likeness of Jesus? Remember, in the kingdom of heaven, great doesn't mean better than others. Doesn't mean being greater than others you serve with or you live with, or you know. Great in the kingdom of heaven is willing to be seeking to make decisions that develop you more like the one who reigns over heaven. That's the focus of greatness we should have. Let them have the new car. Let them have the bigger house. Let them, be, let them revel in that. But knowing all the while what is truly great in this life. The one who bears the image of, image of God, who was innocent of sin, and who we see for the first time, who God sought Adam to be. See, it's in Jesus that we see who Adam was for the first time. Because Adam was like Christ in the sense that he was without sin. And then he fell, and as we are fallen. But we see in the Bible for the first time, God's original intention for man. We see him without blemish or mark or corruption. And this becomes the rubric we are to live our life like. Through the manifestation of the Spirit living in us, we seek to be like Christ. To know and to trust that is the kind of self we are. 
This week I um, was asking some random people, what kind of self are you? And they're kind of like, what are you talking about? I'm just singing Pharaoh, Pharaoh with kids. <laughs> and, I, and I was chewing and processing my, my sermon. And, uh, and so I, I had a point, you know. And usually there's not people here all week for me to kind of talk to. So, you know, sometimes it gets a little lonely. And, you know, <laughs> I talk to myself. But hey, you were all here, so that was awesome to talk to you. I was really thankful. So... But when I ask that question, what kind of self are you? I want to explain. See, some people, they are only a fragmented version of themselves. The fragmented self. Meaning they got different pieces of influence or identity or information or values. And, and, but they can't just bring it together. They're kind of all over. They got influences, they got habits, they got whatever it is. But the reality is, is that within themselves internally, they don't have the strength in their will or in their character. They're fragile. Little things set them off or make them fall apart. Meaning that they're not able to sense who they are and what purpose they carry because they have so many frays and fragments of information or trauma or addiction or whatever it is that they're just all over the place. And some of the people who are like this are the ones that are full of rage or they're really tied to addiction. They're scattered. And they have little internal resource to conceive and cope and carry the need for themselves and Christ to become further and further identified as one. The internal and the external are not matching up at all. And some of these people can be very demanding of time, attention, and, and like I said, are full of, can be rageful and addictive. That's one extreme. And the other side of this kind of s spectrum is, is the fortified self or the fortress self. And I have a slide for that too. And that is someone who's really solidified in solitude. They're like Superman in their fortress of solitude or Supergirl. I don't know if she has one. I don't read that comic. But the fortified self is hardened. It's highly defensive. It's closed off. And it appears needless even though it's full of needs. It appears wantless even though it wants everything. And they are very far removed from the innocence that Christ is speaking of. This form of self cannot and, and will not be moved to humble oneself in a manner to serve as, as the fashion that Jesus models for us. Jesus came not to ser uh, be served, but to serve us, to sacrifice for us. And that is a model that he extends to us to be like him. The Lord came in this manner to disarm us, our fortified selves. And this models to us the reality that if, I don't know if you ever find yourself seeking to be great by the fortified or the competitive living that many are building their life out of. And these are usually decisions that lead to destinations that fail us at one point because we fail ourselves. And the people who build their life off of not needing anyone but protecting themselves are usually the ones who die alone. They usually die full of wants and needs and regrets. And it's interesting, I see that there's this connection between our emotional development and God's covenant with his people. There's a reason why these are extremes, the fragmented and, and the highly fortress self. Because there is another way that he's called us to live. Called us to live so that we could live a humbled life, a truly great life. If everyone could do this with me, just put your hands together like this and kind of do this little kind of motion. Okay, I'm engaging other parts of your brain or I'm waking you up, either one. Here you are. This, doing this, is kind of a model of the, of the, the cohesive self. The cohesive self, if you push together like this, it's strong. But at the same time, it's really easy to open up. The cohesive self is, is someone who's got it all tied together. And it doesn't lose its ability to be open and sensitive to God's leading in your life. But when stuff comes in on you, you're able to maintain that strength. Because Christ is at your core. You're cohesive, you're together, but you're able to be open to what God leads you to do to change. 
like the hope of teaching and inspiring kids this last week at VBS. It's our prayer and our hope that what they can start to build on on their core is that Jesus is Lord and that they love him. And that starts to bring in together their identity and their personalities and their, and their experiences and their family realities. And we want that to maintain in place for their life. Not when they just graduate high school. I was in youth ministry for about 13 years and there's a statistic right now about 60% of high school grads who have a faith will ditch it in the first year. And they go to college and, they, and they, all that VBSs, years of VBS and youth group and camps and uh, mission trips and building homes in Mexico and all that. And they go to college and all that investment and for whatever reason, they just take off Jesus like a sweater and they just put it in their dorm room. Some of them come back to it after a semester or two and others just leave it. Sometimes I wonder, is it important that they know or they believe? And it's key that we understand, do we know this truth or do we believe it? Do we live it out? And we want our kids to know that they're unique and they're talented and they're gifted and, and no matter what's taking place, we want us to be able to claim the same thing, that we are uniquely gifted in place and full of purpose because we're part of God's kingdom. And we're called to be great in that kingdom. And no matter what takes shape, we need to be able to find that ability to be strong when the pressures of the world come in at us because Jesus is at the core, but open to his leading when he calls us to sacrifice this area of self or this doubt or this rage or we need to offer forgiveness or whatever it is. If we need to grow in empathy or we need to not be so hypervigilant or whatever takes shape, can we bring it together because Christ is calling us to humble ourselves and to be like him rather than being fragmented or fortified. And the disciples asked the question, how does one become great in the kingdom? I think a better question that we need to ask is this. How is the self, <laughs> how is the self bearing the image of God? making room to receive the likeness of Christ. How are you making room to receive him? To be rooted in the larger narrative of his covenant for you. No matter your story, no matter your background, no matter your, your, the history. So it's in order that we can be changed from the malice of sin in the corrupted heart and becoming renewed and restored in the very nature of Christ. And so it's integrated in our roles that we live and the goals that we set and the tolls that we take on this journey together. We must see as Christ not only understands their error as disciples, as they look Peter up and down, remember? <laughs> it makes him so special. That he's calling us to place childlike faith in the middle of a world that's always competing, always biting and cutting itself off of. That we are called to live a certain way. I was with a friend of mine downtown. We had a great lunch and, you know, I parked my, my pickup and I, you know, I knew that my vehicle kind of can be um, a challenge to park in downtown, right? Had this great lunch, feeling good, walking back, and I see that there's a note in my car. I want, it wasn't a ticket. I was like, you know, when you, get, when you see your windshield downtown and the meter's flashing red and you, you, know, you get that, you start to hyperventilate. But it wasn't a ticket. And I thought, oh, it's a note. Maybe I saw someone or, or they saw me and they wanted to leave a nice note for me. And I go and I, and I grab it and I open it up. Learn how to park, idiot. <laughs> Thank you. Then I looked at my truck. I'm in the lines. I'm not on the street. I even folded my mirrors in. Like, come on, right? I'm a model citizen today. I don't usually do that. That was like the one time I've ever done that. And there that was, that note. Some people say, oh, they probably, there's a guy next to you and they put it on your windshield. Oh, yeah, no. But there I was. I had to have <clears throat> the cohesive self as a disciple not to just get raged out, right? But to bear that pressure of being victimized and embarrassed and all that. To know that 
I'm stronger than that. And my response should be, I need to pray for that person. Man, I mean, if I'm parking like this and they're leaving notes, imagine what they're doing to the rest of y'all who have no idea how to park, right? (laughs) Slash tires. I don't know what's going to happen to you. But it's a resolve or it's a drive in us to not abandon the call that we are to find true greatness in this life and it's to demonstrate a greater humbleness that is like Christ. That's a moment to say, no, my faith is real. And I'm going to draw from it. I'm going to pull from it. I'm going to submit to Christ's example in that. Rather than being rageful or addictive, fragmented, defensive, all those things. We're not called to be that. That's not great. And the thing is, if you know something about me, if there's an area of conflict, because as Christians, we're not called to be doormats, right? Out of the way, Christian. Oh, bless you. No, we're we're called to be (laughs) confident and full of... (laughs) I love this, just so you know. We're, We're called to be confident, full of love, and emboldened out of that. And if there's a conflict, I like to run to it because confrontation, we have to stop seeing it as a negative. It's neutral. It's a negative because we receive it negative or they present it negative. So if we are called to be in a conflict, let it be neutral and let it not be negative from our end. Let it be full of grace from our end, full of forgiveness from our end, full of empathy and compassion and mercy. Let us be slow to anger and quick to love. That's who we should be. That's how we're great in the kingdom. Not like we got it all together, right? We got all the best podcasts on our YouTube channel, you know, all ready to roll, whatever it is. But what we need to find is this, is that greater the humility means that we're further preparing and we have a larger capacity to receive the likeness of Christ in our life. No matter what comes, no matter your health, no matter your wealth, no matter the weight and the wants that come, no matter what takes place in our kids' lives, our parents' lives, our employment, so that we have that deeper capacity to reject that which corrupts us or disrupts us, so that we can continue to live a life that is great. So my question is, do you want to live a great life? And I think the better example, I hear two people want to live a great life, that's good. Wow. <laughs> The other you are chewing about, it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sunday morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you want to live a great life, well, to be great in the now requires living the example of Christ in the how. And it's key to keep that in mind. Because we have to ask that question. How is the self bearing the image of God making room to receive the likeness of Christ? Where do we need a clean house? Where do we need accountability? Where do we need to forgive or be forgiven? How can we make decisions that change us more more into the innocence of malice and more familiar to the ways of God that he has called you to love and to live? And I pray that you desire that, that you hunger that, that you pursue that for true greatness in the eyes of God. And that those desires don't fall short with just intentions, but they're met all the way through to decisions and change. So that you can see what manifests is a kingdom-like living. A new way of seeing the world and loving your enemy. That's hard, right? But that's what we're called to. How easy is it for kids to forgive? Next minute, ah, they're mad at each other. Say sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then they're off at it again, right? (laughs) Parents and guests of VBS this last week, I want to thank you for allowing this church to love your kids, to teach them, to encourage them, to laugh with them, play with them, a lot of them know how to throw a mean water balloon. I know firsthand. (laughs) And it's my invitation that you continue to journey with us. West Sac, there's so much opportunity here. And there's one church, just one, with a lot of different outlets and different places it meets on Sunday. And my hope is that we can continue to look and figure out what it's like to live in a truly great life as we seek to humble ourselves, to learn what it is to have childlike faith, 
to move further and further away from what corrupts the heart of a disciple and to cling to what is true and what is truly enriching in this life. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the laughter. God, I thank you for the opportunity to teach and to be guided by your word, oh God. Lord, I know there are many of us that have an inner war. The internal and the external don't match. God, I pray that we can just come at your feet and acknowledge you that you love us and that you are our Lord. That we can seek to draw to new depths of that love as we make room in our lives. That we're done with intentions of getting into quiet places with you. Or we're done with intending to be getting right with you, God. That we are just here, open to you. Willing to make decisions that respond out of a love that is undeniable. That this journey of faith, there's nothing else like it. It's really the true way to find a great life. It's to figure out how to live like you every moment, every breath. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling today, who are in doubt or rebellion, that you comfort them, that you hold them by your love, that they seek you, that they are able to find peace only through you. And God, we thank you for our children, that we get to build them up and encourage them and love them and continue to show what it looks like to be an authentic follower because that's what the church needs to be is authentic bless them God in this week ahead may we find ourselves living more into that cohesive self being open to you God and, and able to have the strength of what no matter what comes our way may we be found further and further in your likeness oh God Thank you, Jesus, for this church. Thank you for this day that we get to worship freely and we get to consider that life, that great life. And it's in your name we pray, O oh Lord. Amen.